All right, sweet. So first of all, thank you guys all so much for joining uh, the virtual hiring fair exclusively for the military community through Boots to Bucks. Uh, today, we're delighted to have Eric Cron as our second keynote. He has been a security awareness advocate for a long time. He is a cybersecurity keynote speaker. Um, he actually just finished speaking in Chicago, but he speaks all around the world. Uh, but he's kind enough to give us some of his time today and to speak about what working in cybersecurity is actually like, as opposed to whatever you know you may think he wants to give you the reality um, and so without further ado, Eric, thank you so much for coming on. Beautiful. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thrilled to death. Please, um, let's save some questions till the end, but don't be shy about putting questions up because I'm here. I'm a resource. Okay. So um, yeah, we're going to talk about what to expect in a cyber career. And I'm going to share my screen here in just a minute. Um, but basically I have two slides. It's hard. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. No, I, I'm kidding, folks. Um, it, it is a very interesting and challenging career. We're going to talk about this a little bit. We're going to talk about the threat landscape that's out there, kind of like the, the things you'll be facing, because I think a lot of people, we hear these, uh, oh, it's so great to be in cybersecurity, and, and they just throw money at you and, and you know all of these sorts of things, which you, know, you can make a, a very decent living in cybersecurity. But what they don't tell you is some of the, the bads about it. And I just want to make sure that you understand before you go into this, what it is we're facing. Because um, I find that sometimes people jump into these things and they, they, they get frustrated very quickly because they go, oh, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. Um, so that's, you know, we're going to cover some of that today. And I do not by any means want to discourage anyone from pursuing this. What I want you to do is to understand that Honestly, in, in cybersecurity, there are all these little niches. And he, if you go after the things that are very interesting to you, that's the great way to be successful in this field, frankly. So um, that's what we're going to talk about, what to expect in a cyber career, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I got to get past the narcissist in me here first. And here's um, a lovely rendering of me and my background. Uh, I have been in IT and security since, gosh, 1990s uh, is when I got into everything. Um, and I've worked in a lot of different interesting fields. So I've worked in um, the medical space. I've worked in um, uh, aerospace manufacturing. So we were a 130,000 foot under roof uh, aerospace machine shop. We also did... Um, uh, some weapons um, manufacturing there. It was a company that's called Milcor. They make the MGL, the multi-grenade launchers, which makes for a very fun lunchtime. Um, other things like that. Uh, and then I also ended up, so I was a, I'm a U.S. Navy veteran. I was a uh, avionics tech in the Navy. I was on the USS America. If you do the math, you'll see just how old that makes me. Um, but I worked on the EA-6B Prowlers, the uh, radar jammers on those under wing. They're now moved over to the Growlers. It's still the AOQ-99 stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, when I got out, I, I was a medical discharge. And it was a very interesting thing. Um, they playing with some of the cleaning chemicals, kind of messed me up a little bit. Um, they realized it's not a good idea to do that without personal protection equipment. Um, I think I'm a poster child for that. Uh, but basically... You know, I went from being in a career that I loved, doing things that I loved, to standing on a street corner with a sea bag on my shoulder with a note saying, hey, guys, the VA will take care of you. So, um, yeah, it was an interesting time. Um, I went through this transition rather rapidly, and it was a challenge for me. And so I, I, I love that these things are being put out there now these days that can help you navigate some of this. I did listen to the last keynote. I liked a lot of the things he was saying, especially about gathering um, networks and stuff. And you'll see, I'm going to talk about that here too, just in the cyber side specifically. But there's fantastic resources out there and things like what we're talking about today that are going to be able to help you. So anyways, after I got out of the Navy, um, I was missing the mission, honestly. Um, I love mission-based stuff. It's part of why I liked being in the military. We were doing good things. Um, I ended up back to work for the U.S. Army as a contractor down in Fort Huachuca. Uh, I worked in the, the signal area down there. I worked at what was called the CONUS-TINOS, the CONUS Theater Network Operations and Security Center, 
where I helped uh, roll out the Active Directory for uh, all of CONUS for the U.S. Army. And we, uh, we also did the network infrastructure and some other things. Eventually, we changed our name to the Second Regional Cyber Center Western Hemisphere. And then once they realized that that's a mouthful to say over the phone, they dropped the Western Hemisphere part. So, um, but I worked there for about 10 years uh, where I ended up the security manager, like I said. Um, and this was a heavy cyber operation. So, like I said, we helped roll out uh, Active Directory across North America. We were in charge of all the network infrastructure for North America. Um, we, uh, we did exchange for a while. We did all kinds of fun stuff out there. But we were always a target for nation states. I mean, obviously, they want in the network. And so I learned a lot. I learned an awful lot while I was in there. I was thinking about writing a book, but it'd have to be called Redacted. And that'd be about it. It'd be easy to publish, um, very, very simple to uh to illustrate, but you get the idea. So I saw a lot of interesting things. I kind of morphed from being an IT into cybersecurity full time um, from my earlier careers, but I've been in auditing, which is part of cybersecurity. Um, I ran the audit team, uh, both internally auditing the groups that were within our organization and being um, the, the point of contact when we got external audits from places like DISA and stuff like that, that, you know, if you mess it up, they basically pull your plug to DISA and that's a very bad thing. So I've been on both sides of that. I've been on incident response teams. I've had to do stuff like that. Um, it, it's a pretty interesting thing. Now I'll say this, when you come out of the military environment, even as a contractor to civilian life, some things are definitely different and there will be some adjustments that need to be made with that. So keep that in mind. Um, now, after my military career, I ended up going to ISC Squared, which does the CISSP. I was a volunteer item writer. I wrote questions for the CISSP. And then I became the, uh, uh, the director of member relations and services there for a couple of years. So I got into the certification world, which is actually a very important world in cybersecurity. And I'll mention some of the specifics to that here in a moment. Um, it, uh, it taught me a lot about what does and doesn't matter, um, how it relates to things like degrees and things like that. I was very involved in the certification, cyber security certification world. So keep that in mind when it comes to question times, if you want to ask questions about stuff, okay? Um, so I do have a couple of those certs, which I got long before I worked there. And like I said, I used to write questions. If you've ever taken the exam, you know, it's not a, a, a ton of fun to take. And uh, I feel personally proud of that. <laughs> so yeah, uh, nobody can throw tomatoes at me when I'm not on stage. I love it. Uh, so here's what we're going to talk about. Okay. I want you to understand the threat landscape. Like I said, I want you to understand what it is we're dealing with here, what we're facing here, so you can make a more informed decision. So evolution of cybercrime, got to understand where it came from, where it's at, and what it is we're having to deal with. And then what is it we actually do? Like, like as a cyber professional, what do we do? So let's start off with um, how things are. <laughs> Um, this is my 2022 situation report. You may have seen this meme before. I, uh, I used my incredible graphic skills to, to slap a mask on them because, well, it's a little bit more realistic. But we laugh about this in cybersecurity because this is kind of our world, all right? When you're in cybersecurity, there's lots of little fires burning everywhere around you, and you kind of have to decide which ones you want to put out. You ever watch, uh, you know, firefighters in major fires, they'll walk right past a little burning section over here because, well, it'll burn itself out eventually, or it's not really a threat to things. Let's go take care of this big portion over here that's heading towards the homes. It's very much the same thing. We have to figure out what it is we want to fight. Now, this brings me up to my, my first issue with cybersecurity or first challenge is we are understaffed. You've probably heard that. Um, we never have enough resources, and uh, that includes personnel. So while that's important to understand, one of the misnomers I see is that that means it's super easy to get a job in cyber, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. It's not always, but it's one of these things where we got to figure out what what we're going to do. It's basically threat modeling. Oh, this is a big deal over here. This one over here, eh, whatever, it can simmer for a while till I have more time. 
just understand that this is kind of the world and it's not a negative thing. Again, um, not a negative thing at all. It just is what it is. So let's talk about cybercrime. Um, when I got started way back in the days, this was the, the teens in mom's basement eating pizza, drinking Mountain Dew. You know, it's the typical hacker persona, um, black hoodie with the hoodie up, you know, banging away on keys. Believe it or not, folks, that is not what most hackers look like today, unless they're trying to look like a hacker, which real hackers know that's not what they look like. Um, many do wear black, but the hoodies, totally stereotype. Uh, but in the first generation of hacking, um, this is where people just kind of, they, they wanted to see what they could do. Now, we got to understand that hacking itself is not a bad thing. The term hacking is taking something and having it do something it wasn't designed to do. It's that simple. So early hackers, it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. They would see what they could get a system to do. Uh, extra things that it wasn't meant to originally do. And it was kind of cool. Well, and these people, they started talking to each other and, and then they would try to see what they could get away with. Like, um, you know, can I get past your password? Can I do this? Can I do that? But it was mostly to gain notoriety, right? It was like, hey, check me out. I did some cool stuff. Yay. And then we'd move on. It wasn't a big deal. Now in Gen 2, this is where things started working to like worms. Okay, this is machine. This is this is viruses that jump from one place to another, spread throughout the network. We had Sasser, NetSky, uh, a number of them like that. Okay, they they started getting malicious around there, and then Gen three is where somebody realized that we can make some money off of this. And man, I got to tell you, that's been a game changer. So from recognition to remuneration, um, this is where they decided that they can start making money. So they started spreading what's called botnets which is basically a whole bunch of devices that you can control remotely. Uh, pretty famous for this are people's routers that are connected to the internet. And most of the time they have no idea. Those little IP cameras that you have in your house, those can be infected and you have no idea. They may not even be like spying on you through the camera, but they can use it to do things like uh, denial of service attacks where they flood a system all at once to the point that it can't function and it takes them offline. Um, but, but botnets and stuff started coming up and you started seeing a lot more malicious stuff when it came to money. Now, Gen 4, it got professional, okay? This was, uh, this was people who really knew how to write coding and in mature ways. They started acting as a business, if you will. And even like the modern mafias, moved in at this point. They realized there's a lot of money to be made. They're very good at organizing crime. Hey, what do you know? And uh, this is where they kind of stepped in and got involved in things. So if you can imagine Tony Soprano with a hoodie on, um, it, it really did happen. And still to this day, a lot of the, um, a lot of crime that goes on is facilitated by organized crime groups. Now, these organized crime groups have spread from you know, a couple people in New York or Jersey or whatever to nation states to ransomware gangs that we see out in there. And that's, that's where we've run into this generation five. Now, gen five active underground economy. I don't know how many of you have been on the dark web. I don't recommend just blindly going out on the dark web. Um, you know, finding some forums popping in and saying, hi guys. Um, not a good idea. Um, but it's amazing. There's this total like active underground economy. There's these marketplaces. You may have heard of a uh, Silk Road back in the day that got taken down a long time ago, but that was one of the more popular ones that made the main news. But on these, you can buy services, you can buy all kinds of stuff. Um, you can buy illicit drugs that they'll drop in an envelope, mail to your home. Uh, you can buy uh, fake IDs. You can buy materials for building fake IDs, like blanks for different state driver's, driver's licenses, all kinds of stuff like this, um, all the way down to crime. And, and we'll talk a little bit about this too, but this economy is amazing. And these, uh, these underground shops, they've developed a great way of working, um, a very mature way of working, I'll say, because you're dealing with criminals. Criminals don't generally trust criminals either, but these sites, what they'll do is they'll basically do an escrow service. So I want to buy something bad. 
I pay, the site holds on to it till the other criminal sends me the stuff, I receive it, say, yeah, it's good, and then they release funds to the criminal. They've got this worked out to where it works very, very well. There's, uh, you know, like an eBay, you get, uh, you get people to uh, give you stars, you know, to, to give you kudos, which gives you cred, which gives you, you know, all this kind of stuff, and people will trust you. It's amazing. Again, don't just go strolling around out there. And I mean that sincerely. You can get into places you don't want to be and and you just don't want to do that until you've had some time in here and, and maybe have somebody to kind of mentor you out, out and about on there. Um, but you can see it's grown. It's, kind of, it's gone from these kids in the basement having fun to something that is a, a multi-billion dollar a year industry. And they're run just like businesses. So over in Eastern Europe, which is in chaos right now, obviously, uh, but there are actually like, um, like business office buildings, like you and I would go to work where people come in, you know, they, they may be the employee of the month because they have full on like HR departments. Hey, you're the employee of the month. You get the special parking spot. Yay. You go in, you log in, you do your thing, go over, get a coffee, talk to people at the water cooler. This is exactly like what we do business with. Many of the tools that they use are actually tools that are used by legitimate marketing firms, um, which are still pretty creepy. You know, um, the, these uh, zero pixels or, or you know, uh, these pixels that go in, in emails that tell them whether or not you've opened the email, that tell you whether there's been actions. And then they note that, okay, this is an active account, or they do what's called AB campaigns, which is checking to see um, if I go with this type of phishing attack, for example, versus this one, which one gets opened more often? And they're actually putting this stuff together. It's, it's quite an amazing thing, but understand that what we're dealing with these days is very organized. It's very mature. And, and that, that, can be, uh, that can be an eye-opener for a lot of folks who, who kind of think that we're just uh, you know, out there fighting against some individuals. Now, one of the biggest things on the scene these days is ransomware. And it is kind of a big deal. Um, it, it has, it, it's been hitting the news constantly. So you've probably heard of it, but what is it? Now, I mean, this is kind of a, a cheesy example, but basically imagine somebody breaks in and locks everything up to the point that you can't, there's no way you can get into it. And then basically bills you to let you have your stuff back. This is exactly what they're doing with data. So they get into a network they find all of the data that's just going to cripple the organization, and they use the same kind of encryption that we use to protect our data. In other words, this is strong stuff. This is stuff that, you know, taking a computer and, and putting it full time trying to, to break this encryption would take 150 years or so to break the encryption. So it's not something that's going to, uh, uh, to fall apart easily, but they take your data and basically they take control of it. They say, if you want it back, you got to pay for it. Now, the brilliant part of ransomware is ransomware works in every industry that's out there. It doesn't matter if you're a bakery. It doesn't matter if you're a Fortune 100 company. You need your data to do your business. You need your contacts. You need to know who to bill, who to pay, um, who owes you money, what gigs you have coming up. All of this stuff matters and you have to, you, you need it to do um, your business. And that's where this really comes in. That's why ransomware is so effective. Now, what they've started doing, because people got really good at doing backups, just to give you an idea how these things progress, they got to the point that um, instead of just encrypting data, because people would go up, oh, okay, go into backups, restore it all, they're up in a day, not paying the ransom, this happened over and over. They said, well, what if we steal a bunch of this data? And this happened late in 2019. Let's take a bunch of data, and not only are we going to say, if you want your data back, you got to pay us, but if you don't want us to take all this data, you know, your, your secret sauce, your employee information, your customer information, and dump it on the internet, then you have to pay. So it didn't matter if you restored your stuff quickly or not. Um, they've got this kind of like giant anvil hanging over your head. And to give you an idea just how nasty they've gotten with some of this, down here in Florida, there was a plastic surgery clinic because it's Florida. Uh, and this plastic surgery clinic got hit by ransomware. And what they did, they stole all the data, ransomed everything. And when they realized the clinic wasn't going to pay the ransom, 
they actually started reaching out to customers of that clinic and saying, hey, if we don't get paid, your before and after plastic surgery pictures are going on the internet. And you can imagine how happy people were about the idea of before and after plastic surgery pictures on the internet. Um, so immense amounts of pressure. This is the kind of like, this is what they're going after. This is, this is how bad it gets. Now, my heart is in this because I don't like seeing people take advantage of other people. It's also a mission-based thing. We're out there to do better than just for us. And that's what drives me in cybersecurity. So um, keep that in mind. It, it's, it's interesting. And of course, ransomware has been around for a while. Um, it's not new, but it is improved. Uh, the first one was actually out in 1989. And here's just a little bit of trivia for you that's kind of fun. 1989, I was in high school. Yes, that long ago. We did have computers back then, believe it or not. Um, the first ransomware is called AIDS on a floppy disk. Um, they distributed it at a uh, um, like a HIV AIDS research conference. It was done by a doctor and biologist. And it basically, people took it back. They they launched this program, and after 90 reboots, it infected their computers. This is 1989. You had to send a, uh, it was like a cashier's check to this P.O. box in Panama for 189 bucks. And when the guy got busted, um, and he did get busted uh, over in the UK, um, he said, well, you know, I, I was just raising money to do this. Any money that I made from this was going to go into HIV or AIDS research. And, and you know, I, he, these folks are able to 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 make themselves feel good about what they're doing or uh, it's not that big a deal now that dude he would honestly never face charges as far as i know because they they ended up uh, calling him unfit to stand trial i uh, go figure but um these Please. these attackers these folks that we have out there a lot of them what they do um they can justify this to themselves especially when they're attacking the west they go oh americans they got all this money what's it matter they lose 100 200 bucks ah, no big deal you know um they it's america um or they they grew up in a culture where it's like well if you fell for it that's your own fault right like um they they really honestly believe that but this has been going on and growing for a while now one of the cool things to me one of the things that fascinates me is they use something called social engineering. Now you may recognize this uh, this character up here. This was one of his first like breakout things. This was from uh, Mr. Robot, which is a fantastic series for the first two seasons. Kind of jumped the shark after that, um, and and it wasn't as great. But it's a little bit on the raw side. You don't sit down with the kids and be like, "Hey, let's go watch Mr. Robot." But the cool thing about Mr. Robot um, is that. It's actually based on real hacking techniques. They use actual and real tools. I know some people that wrote some of the tools in there. Um, they use these social engineering techniques. And this is one of the lines from there. I've never found it hard to hack most people. If you listen to them and watch them, their vulnerabilities are like a neon sign screwed into their heads. Well, social engineering is, is the art of hacking people, essentially. It's it's using humanity against us to get us to do things. And this is a key part of a lot of the attacks that go on out there. Now, what does this mean? It means that although in cybersecurity, a lot of times people can get away with just doing tech all the time, it's a very powerful thing if you can understand how people work. And we need to understand when we go into cybersecurity that we're not just facing technology. It's a different piece of it. And I'll, I will talk about that in a minute. What they do is they actually use emotional attacks against us. They use these, uh, um, these, these strings like on a puppet here, right? They use greed. You've probably heard of the Nigerian prince scam, right? Yeah, sure. He's millions of dollars, just needs to get it out of the country. There's curiosity. Um, there's a lot of ads we see out there that are what's called clickbait, gets you to click on things, takes you to a malicious website, stuff gets installed on your machine, self-interest, things that are important. Now there's almost always going to be urgency involved. I've never seen a, uh, a cyber attack that starts with something like, Hey, whenever you get a chance, can you, you know, open this document, click this link, give me your social security number, wire me 150,000 bucks. Why not? Right. There's always a sense of urgency and a story behind it. Now, fear, fear of losing your job, et cetera. Now, why I'm going over all of this is 
the number one way that all of these hacks end up happening and, and the number one way initial networks get compromised is through email phishing or one of the other social engineering things, but almost always email phishing. So when we talk about like, you know, you need to watch out what you click on and stuff like that. Um, a lot of people go, yeah, 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 not, not a problem. I, I see these things when really they're pretty complex. Um, and, and again, almost every time I see it, it has to do with that. Or a lot of times it has to do even the number two stuff, which is like a remote desktop uh, or remote portals has to do with people using horrible passwords. You know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Nobody's ever going to guess that. Q-W-E-R-T-Y, nope. Or if you reuse passwords, that's another big problem. These are all human problems. So if you see what I'm getting at here, cybersecurity is very much a human issue, not just tech. So think about that when it comes to securing things. Now, depending on your role, you could be, you know, you could do code review. You could do something like that where you don't have to deal with bad people. But if you ever want to get in leadership in cybersecurity, there's a good chance you're going to have to deal with this element of it. Now, some other things besides ransomware and some things that they use as social engineering for is called business email compromise. It's wire transfer fraud. It's getting people's W-2s and, and filing their information in a fake way. It's stealing gift cards. Um, this is a, a $1.8 billion a year business, believe it or not, um, that people are doing this. So this is a lot of the cybercrime stuff. This is what we're dealing with, really. We're dealing with ransomware or viruses. Those are some of the two key things. And right now we see a lot of stuff coming. Um, uh, it, there's a resurgence a bit in things like Trojans that will remain quiet on your computer until you go to a banking website. It knows that's a banking website. And as you type in your username and password, it's stealing that and firing it off to, to the bad actors again. This is pretty constant how this is going. So this is kind of what we're facing, all right? Now, I'm gonna tell you some secrets of the industry. I already kind of told you some of them, but we fight a people problem as much as we do technology. Now, technology is fantastic, but a lot of times the technology that we have out there is designed to keep the damage to a minimum or stop when a person makes a mistake, when a user clicks on something, launches that virus, um, gives away their credentials. The technology piece is very much trying to stop that from going too far. It's trying to limit how far attackers can get once they are in the network. Um, that's what the technology does. The other secret of the industry is we're never really he hailed as the hero, okay? When the spotlight is on us, when we really shine is when something really bad has already happened. Um, we're only heroes if we stop it from happening. The problem is we stop things from happening all the time, yet nobody sees that it could have happened or gone bad. Now, that's not a negative. It's just something we have to understand. Um, we are not going to be hailed within an organization as the hero. Depending on how we deal with other people is going to make a difference in how well we're liked um, or respected. But nobody comes up to you at the end of the day and says, hey, I really appreciate your work in this 23 hours. You did a great job not letting anything happen. Okay. And that brings me to the next one. Hours are long. Many times require being on call. One of the most fantastic things about my current job is I am not in charge of anyone, nor am I on call. Um, I kind of think I, I, I did my time. That's what I tell myself. That's how I justify it. But the thing is, cybercrime doesn't happen Monday through Friday, um, eight to five. It's all hours of the day, especially given that a lot of these bad actors may be in different parts of the world. They're also getting to the point that they're very smart about firing off things, making bad things happen at the worst times possible. So we've seen a lot in education um, and government where the biggest like damaging stuff such as ransomware ends up being kicked off on Friday before a three-day weekend because they know that people are already headed home. Um, they're going to be gone. They're on vacation. They're out camping. 
Um, they've chucked their phone out the window on the way home because they want a nice quiet weekend. So response times are much slower. Getting a hold of the leadership that's got to make some decisions, much slower. And you're even generally on a skeleton crew, meaning when something starts going wrong, it takes longer to spot in the first place. This is the kind of stuff that, that they're doing that we have to understand. So we're always on call. Now, again, not necessarily a bad thing, but in, in the cyber industry, it's something that we have to do. Sometimes you'll trade on call with other people on the team. You know, somebody is, is on call during these times or that times. But what it means is you can't get the call while you're out at the club, you know, after you've hammered down like seven or eight uh, rum and Cokes and, and get the call and say, hey, we need you to come in here because we just found somebody in the network. That doesn't work. Okay. Understand that. And it's a lifestyle. So cybersecurity is a lifestyle. If you do eight to five, Monday through Friday, you go home for the weekend and you do absolutely nothing in the evenings or weekends to learn and to delve into this, your success will be limited. I'm not going to say you can't be successful, but your success will be limited. And honestly, you're probably not going to like it very much. When you start seeing things as a, uh, as a challenge, and you, you really like what's going on. You're like, okay, this is cool. Ooh, I'm going to learn how this works. I saw this thing. When you have that kind of interest in it, where you go home and, and maybe you fire up the laptop while you, you know, your, your wife's sitting there watching Netflix, or if you're not married, you're, you're just like, cool, let's go check this stuff out. You know, you put on your hoodie. Um, learning how this stuff works is a key important part of this, but it can't be done nine to five, Monday through Friday. The other thing is, despite all of the things that I've told you about it, it's incredibly rewarding because although people may not come up to you and pat you on the back and say, good job, I have no idea if you did anything good today, but, but I'm guessing you did. When you do something good, when you stop something, when you keep the information of your organization or your coworkers from falling in the wrong hands, that, that you know you did. Generally, you go, man. Ha ha, I kicked him out. Ha ha, I know what they're up to. And you actually feel really good about the things you've done. Again, kind of mission oriented, right? This is why I'm in this. This is why I love doing this. This is why I do the speaking I do right now. I talk to a lot of people just getting into cyber and, and try to share my insights with them, things I've seen. So you don't have to do all the same things that I did and messed up growing up. Um, but it's incredibly rewarding at the end of the day. You just don't always uh, you know, expect that pat on the back. So how do you get ahead in this industry? Well, as I mentioned before, although we're shorthanded, it doesn't always mean getting hired is easy. And I've seen this happen time and time again. It can be a somewhat closed industry. Now, before you get upset with us about this, you got to understand security professionals, Cybersecurity folks, we have access to privileged information from the organization. If, if we don't know you, if you don't have a background, if you don't have something coming into this that we can trust, um, we have to take that risk with you. And, and it doesn't matter always how good you look on paper. It doesn't matter any of that. This is why having a good network is such an important thing. Okay. We work with tools that far too often we can break entire networks very, very quickly. And that is a bad thing. Uh, generally, the businesses that we work for like to be able to, uh, to be online, making money, making widgets, doing whatever it is they do. And we can very easily take that away with some of the tools we use, even just simple like um, application scanners. You go to, to scan your application uh, or your website, and all of a sudden you folded it in on itself. Now, it's important to know that that happens, um, but we have to trust people to know maybe when not to go, you know, uh, full crazy like that. Uh, there's some tools out there. There's one that's really cool called uh, Chaos Monkey. It's actually by Netflix, just a, a little side note. And it actually goes through their network and randomly shuts down different services to see how the network responds. Okay. Most organizations are not at the point that they want to do this to themselves. Um, uh, chaos testing is not something that happens all the time yet. The tools we have 
unfortunately accidentally do it sometimes. And we often work with little or no supervision. And I got to tell you, a lot of times our bosses have no idea what it is we're doing. They may be an IT person. They may be a CFO, a chief financial officer. They don't know what it is we do, but they've given us the keys to the kingdom. So that's a, that's a scary thing. And what this means is when I'm looking through resumes, when I'm hiring somebody for one of these roles, if I have somebody that I know that says, hey, I know, I know this person. I know Bob. I know Alice. They, they do a pretty good job. They're good people. That will, will get you hired way faster than a pretty resume will, um, or even relevant experience. Because I know if you're a good person that's trustworthy, and if you have an aptitude for this and an interest in this, I can teach you to do things. But what I really worry about is, is this person going to be a loose cannon running around in this network causing trouble, accidentally or otherwise? Are they going to be able to follow my guidance? And this is where being military comes in very, very handily. And something that I love to see when I was looking for people to hire, military always stood out to me because you understand a chain of command and you understand that if I say we need to do this, even if you don't understand exactly why, military people understand that sometimes they don't know the whole picture and we can just execute on it. All right. Um, that kind of feedback from people is tremendous for somebody that's hiring because you can see what we can do to a business if that person is a loose cannon. Now, how do you build this reputation? Um, this, this reliability and trust, trustworthiness is huge. And the fact that you may have had a clearance before, while that's good, it doesn't always tell me the whole story. I mean, it's always nice. If I see someone that had a TSSCI, I go, okay, they, they, had, their, they had their stuff together at least for a while, right? Um, they were able to pass some pretty serious background investigations, um, but that doesn't necessarily tell me what you were like today, especially when you're on your way out of the military, okay? So you want to build this uh, reputation of reliability and trustworthiness. So do what you say. This is so important. If you haven't done something be honest about it, but be willing to try. In other words, you can go, hey, you know what? I think I got this. Haven't done it before, but it makes sense to me. So if you're cool with it, I'll take this and run. That is so much better to me than someone that goes, oh, yeah, 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 I got this. And then they get into the, the, the tool and they start pushing buttons or they, they do something that they just had no idea what they were doing. And it ends up taking down the organization or it ends up causing problems. Or in the worst case scenario, what happens a lot of times is people will misconfigure something and now it's available to everybody on the internet and you have a huge data dump on your hand. Okay. So if you haven't done something, be honest about it, but be willing to try. And if you tell me, Hey, I'm not sure I may have somebody supervise you, or I may come back and check it later and go, okay, cool. We checked all the boxes. We made sure these permissions were in place. Awesome. Cool. Now you've done it. Great. But the minute you go in over your head and don't ask for help and start breaking things and then, you know, make up excuses about why it all happened, you've just dropped a lot of trust on me and you're probably going to be relegated to the more junior positions until I can get that trust again. It's a harsh reality. It is what it is, right? Um, this is why, you know, we don't have uh, E2s running around necessarily planning large battles. It's just a matter of having um, uh, experience in things and learning, okay? Always ask for help. If you're, if you're getting in over your head and somebody goes, hey, boss, I'm not sure I feel comfortable with this, um, that is, that I would rather see that a thousand times than just blindly trying to go through some stuff, okay? Network with others and share the knowledge you have. Believe it or not, you have knowledge already, and it, it, it's... It's something that we don't always think of, but you have experience with certain things where you are, even if it's with organizing things, it may even be with writing policy. You may recognize good policies and go, wow, okay, because policies are a keystone to all of this. Um, so that may be your, you know, your super, your superpower and you don't even realize it, but share what you have. 
um, work on your soft skills and the ability to communicate with leadership. Now, civilian leadership and military leadership are very differently, are, are very different. Um, I've had to brief, you know, um, general officers way up the chain for a lot of different things and incident response and stuff like that. I treat them different than I do a CEO or CFO or, or COO in an organization when I'm briefing. We have different things in common, uh, different things as goals. A CEO these days is responsible for the organization remaining healthy and being profitable. Okay. Um, a general level officer doesn't really care about the profitable part of things. It's all about mission, right? So work on those soft skills. I find that believe it or not, um, doing things like, um, like a stand up comedy course, believe it or not, that gets you in there and gets you able to think on your feet, uh, like improv type stuff can actually help you in huge ways as you go through this, this transition and getting out there and dealing with other people. It makes you think quick on your feet. It makes you clear in what you're saying, and, and it makes you more comfortable being the target of people asking questions. It's actually a really good exercise to do stuff like that. So work on those soft skills. Talk to people. If you see other people that are in the industry and you're doing something, say, how, do, how does this sound to you? Run it by them because that is a key thing. Um, also, look around for local groups on Meetup. Like here um, in the Tampa area, we have what's called DC813. It's a it's called a DEF CON group. It, they get together like almost every week. Um, everything from lock picking workshops at a brewery to um, learning how to look at um, web stuff and see how you can um, like break in through browsers and do browser vulnerabilities. Like all this kind of stuff. They do it all the time. May not always be right in your area, but it's a great way also to learn and to network. Check out ISC Squared or ISSA chapters in your area. ISC Squared chapters, they actually, you don't have to be a member to join these most of the time. And a lot of times they're free, but you get to go talk to people. You get to network with people. They get to know you. And next thing you know, they're the ones going, hey, you know what? I, I've met him a couple of times or I've met her a couple of times. And they seem like good people. They're willing to learn. That follows your resume, right? Look for certification study groups because you're going to need certs. You, you just are. I hate to tell you that, but attend local conferences. Look for B-sides conferences in your areas and try out some capture the flags. If you want to get into hacking, look around for beginning what's called capture the flags. These are basically like escape rooms on a computer. And a lot of them are free or a lot, some of them are cheap, but a lot of them are free. And basically you get to learn how to hack. And as you correctly hack certain things, which can be as much as searching through directories for certain things, you get what's called a flag. You enter it in here and it unlocks your next challenge. This all happens online. It's like I said, like an escape room. They're fantastic. It may tell you whether or not this kind of stuff gets you going. My daughter was 16 when she sat down at one over here and she was fascinated. She wasn't any good at it. I helped her with some stuff. I was, here's some commands. Here's some things. Oh, did you think about this? Man, she is hooked on this. And now she's actually very interested in a cybersecurity career. She loves doing C, uh, CTFs. So keep that in mind. They're out there. They're online. Um, also, degrees versus certifications. They can both be an HR gate, okay? And they can get you past an HR gate. I may be an exception to the rule, but... I didn't get my degree until 2015 when I finally started hitting the wall. Um, now, certifications are different stories. Uh, a lot of certifications are needed, like Security Plus is a big one just to get you in the door. It's not that tough to get. There's study groups for that. It is a financial um, uh, spend that you have to do to take the test. And yes, you may fail. Um, but that is a good start. If you want to get into cybersecurity, get your security plus, okay? Degrees tell me you have a rounded education. You've been through stuff. You've seen different things. Certifications tell me it, that at one time, you had a certain level of knowledge about a very specific thing. Could have been five years ago, could have been a year ago, but at least I know you've been exposed to that. You've seen it. You had a level of knowledge at one time. Don't get cocky about either. I see people with the CISSP going, do you know who I am? And it just drives me crazy. Yes, it's a tough cert to get. Yes, it's got some prestige, but it doesn't make you any better than anyone else. Same with degrees. Well, I have a master's in, you know, underbought or basket weaving. 
it doesn't really matter. We, we do a lot of things by meritocracy in the security uh, community. The, the last thing people want is for you to run around doing stuff. Quick side note, when I was in the military, um, I had a guy try to challenge me on something, sent me an email, and in his signature, he spelled out all of his certifications uh, instead of the acronyms. So I replied to him and spelled out all of my certifications um, just to hopefully make him realize how stupid he sounded by trying to throw that at somebody, okay? Also, keep learning. Once you've got that cert, awesome, great. What's the next thing? Keep learning. Just keep on that treadmill. Um, and then continue to learn. Our attack landscape is changing. We've got deep fakes out there. We've got fake news. We've got gangs, uh, cybercrime gangs out there. We've got botnets. There's all kinds of things that you can learn about. Um, and, and there's conferences. There's expensive ones. There's inexpensive ones, um, especially now that virtual is an option. A lot of these B-Sides conferences are virtual. It's like 25 bucks for a whole Saturday worth of training. Come on, man. You can't beat that. Um, Google can help you. Google is your friend. There's YouTube on a lot of stuff out there. And don't hide your interests from others. If you find a niche that you're into, like you get into things and you're like, man, I am loving this like pen testing thing or the social engineering stuff. There's actually jobs out there where people pay people to try to call up their employees and get information or physically break into buildings. That's a career path, folks. And if you see that and you're like, whoa, this is really cool, pursue it. Tell others that, hey, I saw this. I'm kind of into that. And they may go, you know what? I got somebody who does that. You want to talk to him about how it really is. So hopefully some of these things have, have made you look at it. This is my contact information. Reach out to me on LinkedIn or, or Twitter or whatever. I do a couple podcasts too. I do one every, um, every Friday morning. We do one. Um, it's called The Jarek Show. Um, there, there's lots of different ways to get a hold of me. Feel free, reach out at any time. I'm always open for that. And right now, let's get some questions in the chat if you have them. Um, or we can even, uh, you know, do the whole unmute thing. I'm, I'm not afraid of that either. I'm going to go ahead and stop my sharing and, and maybe throw it back to, to Aubrey here. But I hope you learned some things. Hope you had a little bit of fun. Um, let's see what we got. Thank you so much, Eric. Yeah, uh, if you guys were here on the last keynote, we actually had some live discussion last time and it was awesome. So if you guys are brave enough to hop off mute, I see, I think I saw Joshua say he has so many questions. If you have a question, go ahead. And ask <laughs> yeah, don't be shy, Josh. Come on now. Let's see it. Hey, Aubrey, I sent you one from Brandon. Uh, you might have to check your private message. Let's see. Um, I don't see it. I I'm it. here. I could, I could Go recite it. it again. Um, let's do it, Brandon. Let's do this thing. Yeah. Uh, so my first question was, um, would you say we're entering gen six of like cybercrime, where we have smaller nation states groups that are governmentally funded, but not like plausibly linked to nations. And that provides a great return. Would you say that's the next generation of it? Because some of these are being stood up in even other countries, but still like support like Iran, Russia, and North Korea. Yeah, I don't know that I would, I would put that in a whole nother generation, maybe, you know, Gen 5.5 five or something like that, because that's been going on for a while. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what's happening right now is we're seeing a lot more of it in the news. We're seeing a lot more attribution saying, okay, cool. These people are, you know, they're, they're tied to Russia or Ukraine or whatever. We're seeing that stuff make the news a lot right now. We know that, I mean, China has been at it for a long time and each of these groups has different focuses. A lot of times China is, is oftentimes after intellectual property. They want to steal the stuff that you've spent a lot of money developing and then make it for pennies on the dollar, sell it on AliExpress and flood the market with that, okay? Um, Russia tends to be disruptive. They like to come through and just wreck things, okay? Um, them and their semi-state-sponsored um, groups, okay? Um, so things like NotPetya, um, which was a disk wiper disguised as, um, uh, as ransomware. I believe that's the one that took out Maersk, the big shipping company. Um, those folks are doing that. We have, you know, Iran's kind of the same way. And then you have North Korea that loves to make money because they're under so many sanctions that they just love to get money. Um, and so 
these have been around for a while. I think they're becoming more popular as we're going, okay, and somebody's saying, we know that this APT is tied to this group and they're being more open about it. Where before people were like, well, maybe, maybe not. Um, the attribution wasn't such a big thing. So I don't know that it's a whole new generation. I actually think the next generation is going to have a lot to do with AI, frankly. And that, I think that's AI... Amazing. That's a good point, Eric. I mean, especially when you look at a lot of the uh, a lot of the threat companies, right? Uh, the Attack IQ, uh, Demandiant, uh, Arctic, uh, Arctic Wolf, and all these places, they're looking for people that want to do threat research. Yeah. And I mean, you could probably fill up an entire 80 hour work week of doing nothing but Googling <laughs> about state sponsored actors. But think of that because there's other segues in the cyber. Yeah. Yep. You know, uh, one of the guys, a good friend of mine, the guy I do one of my Friday podcast with Javad Malik, um, he, he started with like, well, he started in another place, but he ended up, uh, he, he really got into it with uh, 451 research and doing even vendor research. And how do these things work? Is it a bunch of garbage? Is it snake oil? Is it real? Is it what? Um, there are some very interesting things in cyber that you can make a living doing. Now, like I said, I think the next gen is going to have a lot to do with AI. So if you want to learn some things, man, go out there and, and install TensorFlow. Um, play around with it. Um, I see Josh raising your hand here or something here, right? I've been down. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, I got you. I went down the rabbit hole in <laughs> um, AI and uh, a lot of that stuff. A lot of good came out of it. So what I've noticed in software programming or anything that you learn even if you veer off course the knowledge is not wasted no. because later down the line for instance i was learning about um i was using image j to extract topography data from mars and i made i i, I grabbed and turned it into grayscale and made a 3d mesh of it and then i went to as deep as to find you know how ai goes through and checks the pixels through the kernels and stuff and I oh you're, i'm losing you is it just me guys uh, joshua i think uh, you're, okay hit your space you bar, uh, Josh. Oh, there we go okay so it just happened the next day i was worried about studying we were learning about it as such but i am really concerned about because we're, we got quantum computing about to take off. Um, and supposedly, I don't know, I heard about on this, uh, some systems or like, you know, talks, podcasts that they've actually um, attached AI to quantum computing to be able to pretty much understand like the circuits that the qubits run through and all that stuff. And that in itself, like that's going to be a huge issue and probably a new speed bump that, we would face. I think that would be the biggest. Yeah, quantum is interesting. And, and honestly, my one of my coworkers, my colleagues, Roger Grimes, he wrote a book on quantum. It's one of his like 13 books he wrote. Incredibly smart guy. Okay. Um, I, I think we're, we're moving towards that. It's going to be a different type of thing. I think the AI piece is a very powerful part because we see it in use already in a lot of devices or, or a lot of um, uh uh, attack vectors from the, the attackers as well as defense sides. Okay. And if you look at deep fakes, for example, I love deep fakes. Okay. Taking somebody's face, putting it on someone else in a movie. We've all seen these kinds of things where they replace an actor with Tom Cruise's face, right? Um, deep fakes are incredible. They just did one with the, uh, the Russians did with uh, one with Zelensky too. Um, but basically it uses AI to look at these and they have what's called a GAN, a generative adversarial network. And essentially they put together a deep fake and then the deep fake um, is checked by a deep fake checker that's an AI. And if that can determine that it's a deep fake, then it regenerates and it, it keeps doing this, keeps cycling it until the AI that's made to detect deep fakes can't tell that it's a deep fake. And then it goes, okay, done. Um, they're using AIs to create better bad stuff, just like we use AIs to create better good stuff. And if you, if you get to know some of this stuff, I mean, you know, if you know, Josh, 
TensorFlow, you can get into stuff like that. It's free, deep learning stuff. Um, all that stuff's available for free. You eventually might find yourself writing a pretty healthy check over a, a new video card because that's where all the processing happens. Um, but ultimately, if that stuff fascinates you, go for it. So, but so I mean, quantum nano is another pro uh, topic that we would need another day worth uh, yeah. because <laughs> yeah. when you when you think about the quantum nano, uh, we call it the quantum apocalypse, is what Roger Grimes likes to call it, right? Yep. Three to five years from now, the first quantum nanoprocessor is going to hit commercial. This is why a lot of companies are, are really seeking data scientists and data analysts, right? Because the, the, the data lake that's going to be available, they're going to have to have humans to digest everything and you know create that human readable format. But on the same concept, XDRs are going to be coming out. Uh, and they're going to be hitting the, the streets very hard to the point where I forecast a lot of companies are going to start losing analyst ones and analyst twos. Because as we start getting more and more into zero trust and encryption, an analyst one is not going to know how to, you know, decrypt TLS, SSL traffic on the fly. Right. And you're going to start seeing more threat analyst one, threat analyst two as your entry points in the cyber. And it's, it's, if you notice a trend on LinkedIn, that's that's primarily what everybody seems to be focused on is threat intel. Yeah. Use that as an advantage, you know, to, to learn. If you're a linguist, if you have another language that you speak. Yeah. If you're a musician, uh, you know, if you do playwrights or you've done acting, all of these different so uh, kinds, of, kinds of soft skills you have, they're kind of like, pre-imprinted pre-planned uh, pre responses that you already have in your psyche which That's is another right. reason why you know veterans are, are huge yeah. in the cybersecurity market definitely uh, and then critical infrastructure hey so we're going to take two more questions here so we can get you guys back into the chat rooms with a little time before the event ends um so first i'm going to address one uh, and then i'm going to hand it off to you eric to address as well but I, I feel like i have a piece to say about it and that is Cody asks, how do you refer to your network during an interview? I can name drop all day, but connecting the people that have trust in you is harder to get. It, it's harder to get into basically, you know, name drop and stuff like that. So Cody, what I would say is if you have connections at whatever company it is that you're looking at that role at, I would ask them to connect you with the people hiring for it or members of the team that they're looking for it. Because at the end of the day, the recruiter is putting you in front of the team that needs to fill a need. And if you can meet that team and express to them how you can fill that need you've skipped that entire step um, and oftentimes you actually can skip that entire step um so that's what i would say eric do you have and uh, then the other yeah. one is, are there office politics and cyber so i'll cue you up with two yeah uh, i honestly wouldn't go around name dropping during an interview or that but like you said peter if you know you're interested you have somebody in there and they know somebody have them do it Having them go to somebody and going, hey, you know, I know this guy just applied. Um, let them know you're applying. I, I know this guy just applied stamp of approval like this guy. That's going to go way further than you being in an interview going. And Bob and I were out the other day doing that. I mean, it just doesn't it doesn't play as well. OK, so um, keep that in mind. I generally don't name drop in an interview. Um, it's it's about my skills at that point, And I hope that whoever I know may do that. Now, I, what I may say is, hey, you know, I've been really inter I've been very involved in this group here locally. I'm meeting a lot of cool people through this DEF CON group, learning a lot of cool stuff. And, you know, uh, that shows me that you're trying to learn that you may be meeting other people. And I may know someone in that group and I'm going to go, huh, okay. So I may call them and go, hey, you know, this guy said he's been to some DC813 groups. Um, do you know him? How is he? So I wouldn't just go, I know Bob but you can slide some things in that way. And as for the other question, Peter, are there office politics and conflict in the cyber team? What does that look like? Yes. Oh yes, there are. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put it out there. A lot of us in cyber, um, we may not be the, the big social butterflies and there's a lot of people on spectrum. There's a lot of people that don't necessarily have fantastic social skills 
And then you put them together in a team and tell them to work together. And it can be mayhem sometimes. Okay. Um, I'll say this. Twitter is where most infosec seems to gather. Okay. So the, the Twitter infosec side, it's also incredibly toxic. So it's why I don't generally send a lot of people there. Just understand we have a lot of people that, that are not necessarily great with social skills that, uh, that you deal with. And so honestly, it's like anywhere else. You just kind of go, okay, not my monkeys, not my problem. Or, you know, you just got to kind of deal with it. Um, but there, there's going to be in every field that I've ever been in, there's some sort of politics, um, just one way or another. So don't, don't make that stop you. Don't let that stop you. Just know that, uh, you know, this is where those soft skills really come to play. Definitely. Yeah. I think that's a really good way to put it. Um, and then we'll take one more, um, and then we'll wrap it up. I want to thank everybody so much for coming on and, uh, and Eric, of course, for your time. It's, it's, we really appreciate it. Um, so we'll go, Good afternoon. I, if I do not want to deal with the security clearance, which cert would you recommend getting first out of these four? Security Plus, Linux Plus, CCNA, or Certified Ethical Hacker? Okay, depending on what you're going after is going to make a difference there. All right. Um, honestly, I think the Security Plus is a, a good cert. It's relatively inexpensive. It's fairly easy to achieve. It doesn't carry a ton of weight, but it'll knock down a whole bunch of HR um, gates. And what it does is it gives you the experience and the practice of studying and testing and certifying that is a good lead in towards all these other ones. Now, CEH, honestly, um, that that's more specific for a lot of things, but I personally know a lot of people that don't have a ton of respect for the CEH because you can get um, brain dumps and stuff like that out there. So I wouldn't spend a lot on CEH. Linux Plus is fine, but if you end up moving into a Windows shop, that's where you end up putting in your resume, it's going to do very little for you. But Security Plus tells me you have a basic security background and knowledge at a certain point of time. And, and it's, in my opinion, the best first one to get. Awesome. Sweet. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, and I really appreciate it. Once again, I really appreciate your time. I've recorded this. So we're going to put it out to everyone who is here today and also everybody who may be in a chat during it. Um, if you guys have more questions, please feel free to follow up. There's a lot of great resources like Paul, Whole Cyber Human Initiative. Um, you know, if you need help, just reach out. So without further ado, I'll see everybody back in the chat room. Thanks, thank everybody. You.